Hi everyone! In this episode, I'll continue introducing the moving tracks of tropical cyclones. Tropical cyclones' moving tracks can be affected by different weather systems. Apart from the subtropical ridge of high pressure and westerly troughs from the last episode, there are also monsoon troughs, westerly jet streams, blocking highs, the northeast monsoon, other tropical cyclones, and more. I'll now introduce them to you as follows. In the northern hemisphere, the monsoon trough is where the southwest monsoon and the northeast trade winds converge. When tropical cyclones are located within a continuous monsoon trough at the southern periphery of the subtropical ridge, they will normally maintain a westward moving track. When the monsoon trough is broken, tropical cyclones located in the western monsoon trough will normally move northwestwards, whilst the westerly jet stream will cause tropical cyclones to recurve northeastwards. When an originally northwestward moving tropical cyclone moves towards an anticyclone, also known as a blocking high, its track will turn left and move westwards. When a tropical cyclone encounters the northeast monsoon, it usually weakens due to the intrusion of cold dry air. It's often ultimately pushed by the northeast monsoon to move west to southwestwards. Autumnal typhoons generally refer to tropical cyclones that occur in autumn. As the northeast monsoon becomes active in autumn, tropical cyclones are susceptible to its influence. Both the track and intensity will be changeable, posing a lot of challenges to the forecast operation. Once the autumnal typhoons enter the South China Sea, their tracks usually become more uncertain. Sometimes they may even change suddenly, such as the tropical cyclone shown in this chart. After encountering the intense northeast monsoon that has reached the northern part of the South China Sea, it is pushed towards the southwest by the monsoon and weakens. It illustrates the situation that we mentioned just now, where the northeast monsoon affects the tropical cyclone's moving track. On the other hand, if the northeast monsoon isn't too strong, the tropical cyclone may be brought to the north by the westerly trough associated with the monsoon and move towards the coast of southern China while maintaining a certain level of intensity. On the weather chart, we can see many closed isobars surrounding the tropical cyclone. The closer to the center, the more closely packed the isobars, meaning a tighter pressure gradient and stronger winds. Similarly, the pressure gradient is tighter in regions affected by the northeast monsoon. When a location is simultaneously affected by a tropical cyclone and the northeast monsoon, even though the regions nearby are far away from the center of the tropical cyclone, the isobars are very tight. This tight pressure gradient will also lead to stronger winds. As shown in the chart, tropical cyclones Nanka and Lion Rock were at some distance to the southwest of Hong Kong. However, under the combined effect with the northeast monsoon, the easterly winds over the Hong Kong adjacent waters intensified significantly, particularly for tropical storm Line Rock, as its circulation was rather extensive and it previously had the characteristics of a monsoon gyre. Combined with the easterly surge during the period of strongest winds, strong to gale force east to southeasterly winds prevailed over Hong Kong. The winds even reached storm force in the southwestern part. Line Rock skirted past at around 500 kilometers to the southwest of the territory during its closest approach to Hong Kong. This made it the furthest tropical cyclone, necessitating the issuance of number 8 gale or storm signal in Hong Kong since 1961. Line Rock's number 8 signal remained in force for 22 hours, which was the longest duration of any number 8 southeast signal on record. In the figures here, tropical cyclones Kanun and Kompasu were located relatively far to the southeast of Hong Kong. Under the combined effect of the northeast monsoon, northerly winds in the regions near Hong Kong significantly intensified, especially when Kompasu entered the South China Sea, coinciding with a northerly surge that resulted in the occurrence of strong winds over the territory, even though its distance was quite far away from Hong Kong. However, as the northerly winds were sheltered by the terrain, the wind strength in the urban areas hadn't yet intensified significantly. However, the storm surge later triggered by Kompasu, superimposed on the high tide, caused many local places to record the highest sea levels since Mankut in 2018. Storm surges caused by tropical cyclones will be explained in another episode. Although tropical cyclones are sometimes located quite far away from Hong Kong, 
If their outer rain bands affect Hong Kong, they'll bring squally showers, causing the wind strength to increase rapidly within a short period of time. Regarding the local weather, it will change depending on the location and intensity of autumnal typhoons, as well as the development and intensity of the northeast monsoon. The weather can be dry or wet, fine or rainy. It's also another challenge to forecast correctly. The interaction between tropical cyclones is sometimes known as the Fujiwara effect. It is named after Dr. Fujiwara of Japan, who performed a series of experiments and observations on vortices in the 1920s. He discovered mutual interactions between two closely separated cyclonic vortices. The vortices would rotate cyclonically about an axis connecting their centers. This figure summarizes the whole conceptual model of the Fujiwara effect. I'll explain it to you in detail later. In general, two tropical cyclones may start to experience the Fujiwara effect when the distance between them is less than 1200 kilometers. But the actual distance depends on the individual sizes of the two tropical cyclones. When two tropical cyclones come close to each other, there can be several different scenarios. The first scenario is that the two tropical cyclones will move along a stable rotating orbit, followed by the release and escape from each other's influence. For example, in 2009, tropical cyclone Parma near the Philippines interacted with another tropical cyclone, Malor, and Parma underwent a looping motion from 5th to 7th of October. Another example was in July 2017, when tropical cyclone Nesat near Taiwan and tropical cyclone Haitang over the South China Sea attracted each other. They revolved around a central point for a period of time. The second scenario is that one tropical cyclone is captured and swallowed by another tropical cyclone, or the smaller tropical cyclone is forced to weaken and then dissipates. This scenario usually occurs when one of the tropical cyclones is obviously stronger. Take tropical cyclones Noru and Kulap over the western North Pacific in July 2017 as an example. The weaker Kulap was attracted by the stronger Noru. Subsequently, Kulap started weakening and then dissipated. The third scenario is that the two tropical cyclones only show a semi-direct interaction. As the two tropical cyclones are relatively far away from each other, their moving tracks are mainly influenced by the steering flow of other synoptic scale weather systems. For instance, the eastern tropical cyclone in the figure is steered to the northwest by the eastern subtropical ridge of high pressure and it enters the mid-latitude westerlies. Meanwhile, the western tropical cyclone is steered to the southwest by the western subtropical ridge of high pressure. Whenever there are interactions between two or more tropical cyclones superimposed on the steering flow of other synoptic environments, their tracks will become rather complex, making their forecasts even more difficult. There have been some cases with very unusual tracks before, such as Tropical Cyclone Wayne in 1986 and Tropical Cyclone Nat in 1991. They interacted with other tropical cyclones in the western North Pacific. As a result, their track showed many twists and turns, and necessitated the hoisting of tropical cyclone warning signals by the observatory on three occasions. Besides, when tropical cyclones are under a weak steering flow, they often undertake erratic tracks, such as stalling, looping, and others. The dissipation and regeneration of small-sized tropical cyclones within a monsoon gyre may also make the tracks look erratic. Though we've already mastered the basic conceptual models, and numerical models on the computer nowadays can also generally handle the tropical cyclone interaction processes in situations with multiple variables, including the intensity and size of tropical cyclones and changes in their relative positions, etc., different model forecasts may still have discrepancies. Forecasters will master the conceptual models and understand the limitations of these models to then predict the most probable situation. Nevertheless, how to effectively convey the message of uncertainty and track forecasting to the public is another lesson to be learned. All right, in the next episode, I'll continue introducing more information on tropical cyclones. See you!